Welcome to LSAT Unplugged. Nice to be here. Thank you. So thanks for joining. So I should, suppose I should start off by clarifying that although we share a last name, we're not related, at least as far as I know. As far as I know, too. <laughs> okay, great. So I understand that you're at UCLA Law in the admissions department. You're the dean of admissions. Can you share a little more about your background and experience? Sure, yeah. Uh, I've been here at UCLA Law for almost 13 years now. Time, time flies quickly. Uh, before that, uh, right before that, I was dean of admissions at uh, Cardozo Law School in New York City, part of Yeshiva University, and I was there, I think, for about 11 or 12 years. Uh, I did go to law school before that, and I practiced briefly, mostly in the fields of family law and bankruptcy, and also clerked for a year right after law school. Oh, wow. So that's quite, you've been in admissions for quite a long time. I have. One of the older ones, I guess. <clears throat> what are some of the trends you've noticed over time? Oh, boy. So many, <laughs> so many of them, um, you know. This may not be of much interest, but I mean, when you think back to, to really when I started, I mean, there, you know, everything was done by paper, uh, and and the review process was, you know, much more challenging in that regard. And I think both for applicants and for admissions folks, you know, people used to have to mail in their application, and we had to open the envelope and create a file, and we received uh, their LSAT score and transcripts all by mail. So a lot of changes over the years through electronic, uh, the ability for people to apply electronically. I think that's good and bad, you know, uh, on both sides. I think for applicants now, it's so easy to apply to many law schools that I don't know if applicants give that much thought to it. Just, it's just so easy to hit a few extra buttons and uh, the fields just populate uh, that are common. And so it's easy to just throw out 20, 25 applications and see where, see where all the dust settles. Well, it's very interesting. I would imagine that from your perspective, then you're getting a greater number of applications for any given slot for which you could grant admission. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, over the years, there's been uh, significant differences in volume, both up and down. But I do think, it, you know, and I don't know this off the top of my head, but I could find out if I went back 20 years, I suspect that the number of uh, law schools that, that each applicant was applying to was a lot less than it is today. Yeah, I would imagine so as well, maybe going from like three or four to maybe 10 or 12 or exactly. beyond that. Exactly. Yeah. What, so given this, given that, of course, there is increased volume on your end, you have to evaluate far more applications for any given slot. What advice do you give students? What are some common mistakes you see students making with their application? I'm thinking in particular of the personal statement, but of course, if anything else comes to mind. Well, you know, mostly I would just say it's, uh, it's sloppiness is probably the most common mistake. And it sounds so basic when I say it, but it's true how often it happens that people are just sloppy uh, in the personal statement, either by putting the wrong name of the law school at the end of the statement, or just not proofreading it very carefully. And um, it can be frustrating on this side of the desk, right, when you're reading a lot of these, and then you see somebody that just hasn't taken the time to uh, to be professional in the application. And you know, the le the legal profession is a profession, and we want people who are going to pay. You need to pay attention to detail. So it's good to start doing that when you're applying to law school. That that really is far and away the most common mistake I see, especially with the personal statement, is is just putting in the wrong name of the law school. Uh, and also just not proofreading it very carefully, or even submitting something with still track changes in it. Uh, you know, so it happens. Well, that's incredible. And I, of course, we, we want future lawyers to be detail oriented. That's, that's quite important in your law school applications. And of course, that's demonstrated on the LSAT as well. Now, I'm wondering, I'm wondering um, what about, let's say someone has done everything right, but just due to the competitive nature of admissions, they end up being placed on the wait list. I would imagine that wait listing and deferring is also something that I've seen on my end has increased over time for applicants. It's become a lot more frequent. Yeah, uh, you know, um, law schools need need a waiting list. We're not it's, we're not sure uh, how things are going to turn out before our deposit deadlines, and so we need to uh, have people on the waiting list. And um, you know, I encourage people who are on the waiting list to. Uh, to express their interest, to do so in a respectful way, in a way that any law school suggests. Most law schools are going to be upfront about uh, 
you know, usually will provide FAQs, for example, for somebody on the waiting list, you know, how often to express your continued, in, uh, your continued interest and how to express it and what additional materials you can submit. And I encourage anybody in that position to do that and to express your interest, but also if possible to try to then put it out of your mind, uh, presume it's not gonna happen, and then hopefully be pleasantly surprised. What percentage of applicants, if you're able to share, what percentage of applicants typically does UCLA waitlist or defer? Uh, well, I'm not sure what you mean by defer. We don't really, so to me, defer means uh, we're admitting somebody and then they request to defer to the following year. So I'm not sure if that's what you're asking about. That's a whole separate issue. Uh, as a percentage of applicants, I would say off the top of my head, obviously it depends how many applicants we get, but I would say maybe 10 to 15 percent of the applicants each year are offered a spot on the waiting list. Okay, so out of those 10 to 15 percent each cycle over the years, have you noticed any particular standout examples of applicants who demonstrated continued interest in a desirable way? And then on the flip side, any, any standouts in, in a negative light? Yes, both, for sure. Should we start with the negative first? Yeah, sure. That's always juicy, right? More fun. Um, you know, I think there have been people that have just shown up outside our, our office on the day of orientation morning. So I'm walking in on what's going to be a very busy day, and they're here before I'm even here, you know, so it's 7.30 in the morning, and they're just sitting outside the office thinking that because they're there, in case somebody doesn't show, that seat's going to go to them. And that just, I think, just shows bad judgment. Um, and we've had people uh, buy uh, just, you know, buy lunch and send it in to the entire office or send desserts and cakes and things like that. So obviously that's on the inappropriate side. Hopefully most people would realize that. Um, you know, on, on the plus side, I think it's, it's really uh, expressing as clearly as you can why it is that you feel that you want to be part of a particular law school, in, in our case UCLA, maybe some of the particular programs we offer, and why you might be a good fit for that. But at the end of the day, I think you have to realize, as long as you're doing that, you're, you're doing the best that you can. Um, and it, it's, it's factors outside your control sometimes that are going to ultimately dictate whether or not a school is going to be able to offer you a seat, uh, because it's going to depend how many people withdraw, who those people are. Things, things of that nature. I would imagine that each cycle you get a particular applicant pool that varies. And so your ultimate decision for whether to admit a particular candidate or not is based on the mix of who else is coming in that cycle. Exactly. Absolutely. Yep. So it's not, it's not personal, I guess is what you're saying. Absolutely. None of this is personal. Although okay. I know it, feel, I know it feels like it. I've lunch. been on waiting lists. I was <laughs> asking, do you eat the free lunch <laughs> that they send you? Exactly. Uh, yeah. No. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, all right, excellent. So there's, we're talking about changes in the, in the past few years. The biggest change, two biggest changes I can think of, one is the GRE and one is the LSAT going digital. And so I'm, I'll start with the admissions side with the GRE. What's your take on that whole thing? Well, it's our first year, I guess I should say our second year. The first year we, 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 we allowed people who were joint degree candidates at UCLA to apply to the law school with the GRE. This past cycle, the one we're in right now still, was the first year that we fully opened it up. And um, it's been interesting to me. Uh, it's still a little early to say how many people will have in the first year class who will actually matriculate with a GRE score, but I think it will be relatively small. Uh, certainly uh, no more than 5% and probably less than that. So my take on it is for somebody who wants to apply to law school and has already taken the GRE because they're in a joint degree program um, or for any other reason, you know, sure, give it a shot. Uh, but I still think for the majority of applicants in this country and to UCLA, the law school admissions test is obviously uh, the way to go. And thanks and for sharing the numbers on that. What's you know, that? I was just saying thanks for sharing the numbers on that. I think the 5% or below around that ballpark, I think, is a good way to at least get a, a handle on what the scope of this is like. Because obviously it gets, it gets a lot of headlines, but the reality, of course, is that it's still a very small percentage. Yes, absolutely. Now, what does your average GRE applicant look like whom you might consider for admission? Well, um, as I said, the numbers are quite small this year, but most of them are people who have pursued an advanced degree. Uh, or are in the mid, are in the process of pursuing an advanced degree, um, also have very strong GRE scores. Although it's it's not really possible to uh, equate 
a GRE score with an LSAT score. Uh, you know, people have done, people that we're admitting have done very well and have certainly, I would say, comparable percentile scores that, that we would take on the LSAT. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Do they have any particular work experience background, like perhaps in STEM or something else? I wouldn't, I, I don't think I could generalize. I think it's been, and I'd have to go back and take a look, but I think the one, the one thought that comes to mind is that, is that most of them were uh, pursuing some sort of, uh, th th that are perhaps generally an older applicant, been out of school a little bit longer, maybe already have an advanced degree or are pursuing an advanced degree. I don't know about the STEM so much. Uh, we get a good number of STEM students. Uh, right now, I'd say about 15% of our incoming class uh, has a STEM background, and the vast majority of them took the LSAT. Oh, wow. Interesting. Good to know. Thanks. Um, another thing that's been coming to mind for me is the, of course, the LSAT going digital this year. And I know that that's more my side than, than your side. But the reason I, I bring it up is that a lot of applicants are a little bit nervous about the transition towards the digital LSAT. And they're perhaps worried that if they take the digital LSAT, let's say this fall, and their results aren't as good as they would otherwise be because there's less prep material available for that format. Would that impact how someone like yourself might look at LSAT scores this cycle? Well, I got to tell you, this is the first time I'm um, hearing that, I mean, I know about the digital LSAT, but really hadn't thought much about what your, your question and about the concerns that prospective students might have. Generally, I would say, though, as a general rule, uh, you know, we're, we're going to put a lot of weight on the higher LSAT score. So if somebody takes the LSAT and for whatever reason doesn't score well, either because they were sick with the cold or the flu or because it was the digital LSAT, you know, they're welcome to include an addenda, addendum with their application indicating what was going on, what their concerns were. On our application, we actually have a specific question which says, is there anything you want to tell us about your standardized test taking? So I would encourage anybody in that situation uh, to, uh, to then take it again and, uh, and to uh, get the kinks out, so to speak, and then to be able to explain that to us. And I think we would be understanding of that. Law schools are, I can't speak for law schools, but for us, we're going to put a lot of weight on the higher score. That's the score that if you enroll, we're going to report to the American Bar Association. Um, so uh, I wouldn't, I, I, I don't think folks should be too overly concerned about that. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. So it sounds like folks could write an addendum, but also the answer is kind of just retake, get the higher score, get used to it. And that, because that's what you have to report. Exactly. But I appreciate you. I'm going to think a little bit more about that. I, I hadn't really thought about that concern so <laughs> yeah sure it's kind of just a, a funny time with this transition this year you know a lot of folks are like i want to take it in june and get it over with before it starts the transition towards digital and other folks are like it's not that big a deal so applicants on all sides have different perspectives on it but I think hey, correct I, me if i'm wrong don't, don't students taking it at a certain administration the first time won't they have an opportunity to find out their score and then have it canceled yeah, so there's a funny thing happening with the July LSAT in particular. Yeah. Half of test takers will be assigned the digital, half will be assigned the paper. They don't get any advance notice. And right. whichever, that's yeah, crazy, right? right? And then whichever one, whichever one the applicant gets, the test taker gets, they can still see their score before deciding whether to cancel. Got it. Which is kind of a nice little olive branch. It's sort of, of, of a feel-good thing. I'm thinking back to like SAT score choice. Right. But yeah. As you're saying, though, at the same time, though, you do consider the higher score. And so for that reason, I would imagine that there's not an enormous benefit to even a cancellation because you can always retake. Yeah, I mean, that's true. I, I, I would add the caveat, though, just as a general, sometimes we see people that are applying that have taken the test maybe 10 or you know, more times. And I think there becomes a point where uh, you know, quantity is, is not a good thing, even if, that, if, even if there is one score that is significantly better. So I think you need to, unless you really enjoy taking standardized tests, you really need to be prepared when you go in, but hopefully it makes you feel a little bit better to know that it's not everything riding on that, that if you don't have your best testing day, if you know that you're capable of performing better based on your practice test, then you give it another shot or maybe another shot after that. But you know, hopefully three times will be the charm. 100%, definitely. I, I think that there is a, there's a ceiling. You certainly don't wanna have 10 or more takes on your record. But I'm also thinking about how previously I've seen the typical applicant maybe has taken it two to three times, at least the ones that I come across. But with the LSAT being offered with increased frequency going forward, it used to be only four times a year. 
now it's going to be nine or ten times a year. I'm wondering if that may increase the average number of takes for a given applicant, and if that would then on your end increase the number of takes that you consider to be to be reasonable. It may, you know, and I I, I think as I said, it I I don't know why somebody would really want to put themselves through that so many times. Um, I think you really want to go in when you're 100% ready and prepared, knowing that if it's not your best day, you can do it again or maybe one more time. But, um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't think it reflects well, at least from, from our perspective here, our admissions committee, when we see somebody who just keeps taking that test over and over again. Certainly, yeah, there's definitely a limit. I think we agree on that. Well, this has been a lot of fun. I really appreciate your sharing your advice with everyone. Before we sign off, do you want to just share a little bit on UCLA Law and what it has to offer? And then, of course, how folks can reach you? Sure. Yeah, happy to. I mean, uh, try not to go on too long. I could talk forever about UCLA Law School. Uh, in terms of how they can reach me, they can go to our website at law.ucla.edu, which will tell them a lot about the law school. They can reach me at Schwartz R. S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z-R at law.ucla.edu. And one of the aspects of my job that I like the most is talking to prospective students and helping them figure out, you know, I think UCLA Law School is a wonderful law school. I wouldn't be here for 13 years if I didn't think that. Um, it's a law school in many ways that sells itself. Um, but we're not necessarily right for everyone. And so part of what I like about my job is getting to know people, what they're looking for in a law school and helping them figure out if this is the right place for them. We offer so much here that it's impossible in just a few minutes to, to do it justice. But, you know, I, lately I've been saying to a lot of prospective students that I think the hardest thing about law school, especially here at UCLA, is in the second and third year when you're trying to decide what in the world to take. You can pick four or five classes and there's perhaps more than 200 classes to choose from, maybe 50 clinical classes, uh, you know, 15 or so student edited journals and externships and study abroad programs. And how do you, how do you figure that all out? Um, in terms of areas where we focus and specialize, uh, we have about seven different areas where you can specialize. Uh, business law is one, critical race studies is another, public interest law, environmental law, We'll see if I get them all. Entertainment law, can't forget that one. We're in Los Angeles. Um, law and philosophy and international law and human rights. We just got a huge gift to establish uh, what's called the Promise Institute for Human Rights. We have a number of research centers and think tanks. And so the Promise Institute is one. The Emmett Center on Climate Change is another. The Williams Institute on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity Law is another. So those are some of the unique aspects of the law school, but I'm happy to chat with anybody individually. And we encourage people, if you're going to be in LA, to swing by, come on in and take a tour, sit in on a class and uh, see what the place is like. Well, that sounds really interesting. I didn't even know so many of those areas of law existed, <laughs> let alone they're at UCLA. And that sounds like a, a folks go, should definitely go and check out your website and find out more about each of those particular areas. And reach out to you too. And maybe when I'm in LA, I'll come sit in on a class too. <laughs> we would welcome that. Yes, absolutely. It'd be great to meet you in person. Thanks. Well, uh, same. And Dean Schwartz, I really appreciate your taking the time today to share these, this, these pieces uh, of advice with our applicants. No problem. Thanks for what you're doing. I think it's really interesting and uh, good luck. Thank you. you. You as well. Take care.